you are live. Good afternoon and welcome to the Sunset Safari. My name's Brent Gearsmith. I have Brian Joubert and the thumb on camera today. We have Jamie and Andrew on the other vehicle and we have Kirsten and Geraldine on in final control and it is Geraldine's birthday. So happy birthday to Geraldine. And Kirsten got her a range of very strange gifts from Footsprite the other day including bubbles. We now have bubbles being blown in camp constantly. Uh, one even landed inside James's breakfast this morning and as you can imagine he had a very unimpressed look across his face. But we're on our way to go check in with the Inkaruma ladies and the, those lines we left lying up uh, at the end of the Sunrise Drive. I'm pretty sure they're lying in the exact same spot. We're going to have a quick look and then we'll head off and see what else we can find. and toasty today, 33 degrees Celsius. Oh, Brian, do you remember what that was in Fahrenheit? 83 or something, somewhere around there. See, I've got my wide hat on today. Keep that the sun at bay. For those of you who might be joining us on safari for the first time, jumping on the back of the vehicle, myself and Jamie this afternoon are more than welcome to ask us questions about what you're seeing or what you're hearing uh, or anything you would like to know about the African bush. Uh, you can pop either of us an email on questions at TV, or you can use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Here comes the first GEM drive we are seeing this afternoon. Let's pull over. All right. He's going to pull over and use that there. Ah, it's Aubrey from Ajuma. Oops. How's everyone doing? I'll see you just now. Enjoy. There we go. Aubrey taking looks like some people from the local community on a drive. It seems like I'm having a few problems with my radio here. I'm not getting any comments. Just give me a second, sorry. Here we go. Back in comms. and wildlife thanks to Safari Live. Well, thank you for watching us, Nigel. And as I said, one of the most amazing things about what we do is being able to spread the word about the wilderness uh, in all its many facets, great and small. So while we slowly make our way towards some more than likely seriously flat cats, uh, Jamie is with my favorite cat. Definitely high up there on my list as well of my favorite antelope, but good afternoon ladies and gentlemen Welcome to our portion of the sunset safari for those of you who are joining us for the first time My name is Jamie. I have Andrew on camera with me this afternoon and You can see why these little antelope are one of Brent's favorites They are such beautiful little creatures this is actually a fairly unusual sighting. One of the antelope species that we probably see the least of. It's nice to see 
There's two males and a female that live around the camp and around Galago camp. And I think we're seeing one of those males now. And beautiful, what would you describe that color as? Ochre, maybe? Sort of a burnished brown? Either way, the smallest little member of the spiral horned antelope family. And actually speaking of unusual sightings, although it's become more and more usual over the last few weeks, but we've got our warthog family here as well. Obviously they've made their way towards Galago Pan. They're having to travel further and further afield. It's the females, the two females with now five youngsters. Now, I'm almost certain, because I know that Brent saw them just after we had that Tingana sighting where he was eating a baby warthog. And I'm almost certain that it came from this group that originally had six. We often saw them around Zoe's Road, around Denning in that area. <laughs> yeah. At least they've managed to keep the other five alive. They're so cute. Three belonging to one, ma one female, or as far as I can tell from watching Brent's sighting of them from the other afternoon. Three of them to one female and two to the other. Very common for females to band together like this to raise their youngsters. Not necessarily related females either, although it's more likely that that is the case. Essentially just safety in numbers. And they've obviously as I said earlier, having to travel further and further, we're about, probably about two kilometers away from where I think that this family's been denning. And warthogs, for those of you joining us, or fairly new to these live drives, warthogs live in hollowed out burrows within, usually within termite mounds, where they spend their evenings before coming out during the day to forage around on their knuckles like this on their ankles. I think they're terribly cute. Part of the ugly, what's it, is it the ugly seven? I'm having a, a sudden moment where I, I think it's the ugly, no, sorry, it's the ugly five and the secret seven. Uh, the ugly five, apparently. Which I think is really quite unfair. Yes, they may not be as beautiful as our bushbuck, but they are, Definitely not hideous in my opinion, but then I also don't think spotted hyenas are ugly and I think they're also part of the ugly five. Marabou storks, I think we can all agree on. Um, they, they aren't the most attractive of birds, if we have to be completely honest. Neither really are leopard-faced vultures. I can't remember the fifth of the ugly five. Marabou stork, leopard-faced vulture, ah, that's it. Blue wildebeest, or the brindled gnu as they are also known. Also hugely unfair. I happen to really like wildebeest. I'm sure Andrew agrees. Andrew and I managed to catch a almost complete live birth of a wildebeest a couple of weeks ago. It was a very special moment. But especially when they're this age, which is only a month or two, they are terribly sweet. I touched upon the secret seven, and you'll have to bear with me because I can't remember off the top of my head. I know that a pangolin and art fark are in there, and possibly caracal. I'll have to go through the list in my head and just remind myself of what the secret seven are. Definitely pangolin and art fark. I think honey badger. But if any of you guys know, maybe you could remind me what the secret seven is, or are, sorry, no oh dears. What animals are included within the secret seven? <laughs> I really can't remember. But if you have any answers to that question or you have any questions of your own, don't forget that we are live. So we never know what is going to happen or what is going to be around the next corner, as Hayden Turner might say. We're also interactive. So you can send through your questions to us on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. And Cedric, who's watching all the way in Rio, having chatted a little bit about how the poor warthog have to travel 
significant distances in order to get to water. Cedric was saying, it looks so dry here. How does it affect game viewing? <laughs> run, run, run. Trot, trot, trot. Trot, trot, trot. <laughs> so cute. Whoa. <laughs> Bushbuck got it right. So Cedric, in terms of game viewing, there's still places where the animals can have water. And in fact, probably in terms of game viewing itself, to an extent, it's probably enhanced it. And the reason behind that is there are the predators and the prey animals are more concentrated in the areas that they have to be in. So because they have to be around water and have access to water, they're limited to the areas where they can actually go. Unfortunately, what it does mean is that you do see some animals in not so good condition. I've noticed that there's another female warthog with two babies around twin dams who is very, very thin, although that could be for other reasons. These two are looking perfectly healthy, the two mothers of this group, and the youngsters as well. Also only a couple of weeks old, but looking fine and surviving strongly. Hey little ants, and already eating solid food. Awesome. They've disappeared off into the shade. I want to go across to, oh my word, that sounds very bright. I want to go across to Gallego Pan. And while we do, let's finish off with Cedric's question about whether or not, um, or how the, the drought has affected game viewing. In terms of predator sighting, Cedric, it's definitely given us probably some of the most incredible ones we've had recently. Animals are, as I said, restricted to where they can actually go and how far they can actually go away from water. And thus for the predators, you're far more likely to see them wandering around or if they're restricted to the similar areas as their prey species. Now, of course, all of this is a wonderful gift that we are given to be able to experience these wild areas and we are within the greater Kruger area itself. But naturally, part of that, and one of the really important aspects is the way in which people and the conservation areas interact. And that includes the neighboring communities and the neighboring villages. And Kelly, you were wondering whether or not we ever have education, whether the lodges ever bring in local children, for example, local people from the surrounding villages to come and experience these these incredible land and this incredible land and yes Kelly a lot of them do and I know in particular there are people who have specific projects geared towards bringing kids onto even Juma for example we do often see the kids coming through from the local townships to come and go on a game drive and experience it and I find it to be one of the most important aspects and an often neglected one, but something that's essential to the safety and the, to safeguard the future of these conservation places is to educate people and to allow those local people who live right next door. And I've experienced it before where I've taken kids out on a game drive and it will be the first time they've ever seen not just not just a lion or an elephant, but the first time they've seen a zebra or a giraffe. And they get so incredibly excited. And in fact, I can see, it looks as though, funnily enough, Kelly, Taxon is out and he's got a whole group, we won't show you them up close, but he's got a whole group of what looks like locals from. How's it, Taxon? Awesome, that was so well-timed. Speaking of good timing, I believe that we've given Brent plenty of time to make his way back to the lines, so let's find out what they're up to. Come on. Where are you gonna... So as predicted, the lovely Inkaluma, Inkaluma lasses are flat cats lying up in that shade. We saw them move to on the sunrise safari. There we go. You can see how well camouflaged they are as they snooze away. A stiff breeze. All this movement ahead has risen but falls swiftly yet again. 
So only four members of the pride here. The rest are old. The missing female is still with the Birmingham boys. Uh, off to the south and east of us. They just blend into the bush, and if you happen to be a hapless buffalo in yellow, something wandering down, you could easily blunder into them, and that could be a severe career in the move for you. Sorry, guys, just listening to something there. Okay, Sorry, Craig, I uh, missed that update. Um, one of the transfer drivers said he saw a Midori Ingwe um, on the west, uh, right near to Dribble and Moore, uh, a couple hundred metres south of the gate. He was on top of the Dermot Mountain. Okay, yeah, good news. Copy, thanks, Craig. I'm sure Jamie will go have a look in that area. So on a Triple N, uh, just south of the gate, apparently there was a male leopard during the day sitting atop a termite mound. That is a report from one of the transfer drivers, so it could even be a female leopard. So I don't think these lovely ladies are going to be up to much for the next few hours. I think we definitely need to be back here in about, what do you think, Brian? Hour and a half? Two hours. Two. two hours. I think about two hours we want to be back around here in case they decide to get up and move. They might head towards the Juma Dam Cam for a drink. But I think for the rest of the foreseeable future, they're going to be exactly like this. So I did hear there were some elephants about. Uh, closer to Rio Tela, so let's go see if we can find them. And there we go, Jamie is on her way to go see if she can find that male leopard. So exciting times, wouldn't it be great if we can have a double cat bull afternoon? Bye bye in Kahumas. strange-looking beast on the Juma cam last night and needs a little bit of help identifying it. And um, he says it had horizontal stripes on the tail. Um, Sandy, how big was it? Was it and stripes on its back and a long tail? So, Sandy, was it this big or was it this big? That could make a big difference. I have a couple of options. I'll have a look now. So I think one of the likely culprits is just a second. Is an African civet. And I don't have my mammal book with me today. But uh, African civet is a very likely culprit. Uh, or one of the genet species. So, Sandy, did you get a screenshot of? If you did, pop it through to the email address. And we can have a look after drive, or maybe even one of the girls in final control will be able to identify it for you. But maybe as an attempt, what I recommend, Sandy, is go search online, search for African civet. Uh, not the tree civet and not the palm civet, but the African civet. Um, or as well, as well as checking the large spotted genus. Small spotted genus. There's my radio's 
dog. Just letting the guys know we've left those lines. Stations there for Palmer's lying up in the same position this morning. Base for three vehicles. Tucks, uh, we're about to those in the door. Solo after the elephants. Let's see if we can find them. Pretty sure, from what I heard, they were around the Gallego waterhole. So, Mike in Florida. Welcome on the Sunset Safari, Mike. Mike is asking me, is it true that the domestic house cat evolved from the wild cat? It is true. 100% it was first domesticated by the ancient Egyptians. Now cats hold a very important place in the ancient Egyptian culture. And believe it or not, they even used to mummify their, their pet cats. And uh, during the first excavations of, just listen to the radio. During the first excavations uh, around the pyramids, there was a lot of uh, these cats found. Sorry, I just check what's going on there. What are you checking for, please? I get a chance. I'll finish telling my telling my white cat. So there were so many thousands of mummified cats they were actually crushed up and used as fertilizer and shipped back to Britain. Isn't that amazing? There's no elephants as such at the Ajuma Dam. I'm not sure if there were, you would have let me know. Those of you who religiously watch the camera there, so it must be at the other waterhole. Let's see if there's a gap for me to get a I word in edgeways. Trying to find out exactly where to look. So while we try to go find these ellies, let's go see what how Jamie's leopard hunt is going. Oh guys, I'm sure you've already heard the exciting prospects for this afternoon and the fact that we might even be seeing a leopard very shortly. Sure. Taxon and I have had the same thought. We've both come by a Bufflesmith cut line thinking, and I'm sure I'm on the same page as Taxon, that there's a chance that he's going to go and look for the nearest water, which is, of course, Sydney's Dam. But I'm not sure whether he was seen in the morning or sometime this afternoon. Either way, between Taxon and myself, I'm sure we've got high, good prospects of actually finding this leopard. Who knows who it could be? It could be Tingana, it could be Mbula. And a big thank you to James, Steph, Donna and Jasmine for the Secret Seven, Serval and Art Park, a Pangolin, a Janet, an African Wildcat, a Civet and a Porcupine. Oh, have I managed to put any of those on camera yet? I don't think so. The best time for that, and in terms of game viewing, is definitely around the winter period. So when it's a little bit cooler around the area and they start to come out earlier. So those are all animals that you could see on a live safari, but as their name suggests, the Secret Seven, 
They are very secretive. They like to hide away and they are all nocturnal to a certain degree. Probably your best chance, or the ones that you're most likely to see, would be a porcupine, a genet. Oh, genet we have seen. Genet we've definitely seen. I guess I was wrong about the honey badger, which I'm surprised by. Now, it's interesting how different places experience different animal sightings. I've seen lots and lots of serval and caracal and African wildcat before. Unfortunately, less often on Juma. But you never know. I know that the guys have managed to see serval and put them on camera on a live drive before. It's one of those exciting, it's something that gets all of us as guys really, really thoroughly excited to see something like any one of those secretive creatures. And my favorite, oh, the one that I haven't seen, let's start with that, is it's become a bit of a running joke. I have yet to see an art bark. Somehow in my, all my years growing up in South Africa, every time I could have seen an art bark, I've either just missed out or I've been asleep in the car when it's happened. It's been a short and sweet sighting. I've even been on an art bark capture before and I still managed to, it was not, by the way, a very successful capture, but I've even managed to miss out on seeing them in that kind of situation. But thank you everyone for those answers as to the Secret 7. Definitely some of the most exciting features to see out here. My rarest sighting to date was the striped polecat that we saw. Is it a striped polecat or a striped? No, it was the polecat that we saw Brent and myself on coming on our way back from Simbambini. It was definitely the striped polecat. So that's my rarest of the secretive creatures out here. African wildcats are always incredible to witness and the reserve that I used to work at had a wonderful release program where they, it was a rescue service that was essentially not quite hand raised but definitely much more habituated cats that had been rescued from certain different scenarios whether it was from being orphaned or anything like that. Taxon's going to check Sydney's dam. We'll race past him and see if we see any tracks heading past the gate. But yes, African wildcats are incredible to see. And I know that Brent's been talking a little bit about the evolution and the part that they played in bringing domestic cats into people's lives. And of course now that's one of their biggest threats is hybridizing with domestic cats from surrounding areas. And they do look a lot, it looks like your average domestic cat just with slightly longer legs and the typical darker tip around or the typical, the typical back of the ear that's a little bit darker than the rest of them. Ah. Hey, look, we beat, we beat Brent to the elephants. <laughs> All clustered around Sydney's dam. It seems to be their favourite spot at the moment. Awesome. Uh, Texas, who are you calling? Now, for those of you who are joining us for the uh, first time and you're wondering you, um... why we're not going any closer, this is Buffel's Hook. So, although certain vehicles due, due to agreements are allowed to go on there, we do not traverse on Biffles Hook. It's one of those things where between the different landowners and the different parcels of land, they have some set restrictions as to how many vehicles can drive on them, which makes total sense because if you are the owner of a piece of land, you want to keep it from being overrun by different vehicles. This is on Buffles Hook. That's why there's another vehicle across there. What a stunning, typical African sight. A group of elephants clustered around a dam on a boiling hot afternoon. Awesome. Now, I'd love to stay and watch them, but I really want to get across to this leopard or to where this leopard was last seen, just in case, because as we know, with leopards, despite what the textbooks might say and the fact that 
on a hot day, in theory they should be lying up, just as the Inkuhumas were doing with Brent earlier. But they could be wandering through. So I'm going to leave our elephants for now. I know that Brent was on the, on the lookout for other elephants to show you. And while I go searching for the leopard, let's pop over to Brent. It seems like Jamie beat me to the elephants. I think we had a different set of elephants to the ones I was looking for. But, uh, should we beat him to the left? So we're quite confident that those lions are not going to move. And I think those Ellie's at Sydney's are a bit far away. So I'm going to check around here to see if those elephants that we had earlier might have crossed through to this area to start feeding. And maybe just sort of sneakily maneuver towards where that leopard might be. More eyes looking for the creatures. Better chance of finding them. Cam drive radio is very busy today. Lots of vehicles. It looks like guys from Juma are taking some people from the local community on the game drive. And quite often you find a lot of people, even though they live on the border of this vast game reserve, uh, very seldom see things like lions and leopards, so always great to see that happening. Kelly was actually wondering that, so there we go, Kelly. Uh, there we go. Education of the local communities to the benefits of having all this magnificent African wildlife on your doorstep. Dorothy and Tanya who have confirmed what the mystery animal on the Juma cam was last night. It was at the African civet. Fascinating nocturnal creature. They have a special enzyme in this that is created by their pancreas that operates in their stomachs that enables them to be one of the few mammal species that is able to digest millipedes. Now, millipedes from eating lots of rotten, rotten uh, vegetation and different plants are quite noxious. They are one of 
the probably the only only mammal that can eat that here but we'll chat about that a little bit longer uh, jamie for being the smallest wild earth presenter has got the biggest mammal in africa beautiful big elephant bull we've mentioned before that this is at this time during this drought this has probably been some of the or we've seen some of the biggest elephant males that certainly i've ever seen in my time at juma and this is a really magnificent specimen oh there's elephants absolutely all over the show coming across from sydney's dam look at this wonderful view now this is a main access road imagine yourself as a guest driving towards the lodge that you're going to stay at filled with excitement and seeing something like the sky wandering down the road in front of you oh he's in must mm -hmm. i wondered why he was giving me sideways backwards glances i just got a very strong whiff of him impala's watching his approach with a degree of caution now brent's coming up from south of this elephant bull's position now uh, he'll encounter him as well mm, smell that smell andrew <laughs> musty musty yep so an elephant bull in must for those of you unfamiliar with the terminology we're using <laughs> To spell it, it is M-U-S-T-H, must, but it is must. And in the back there goes Brent, searching for this leopard as well. But what that is, in, term, in elephant terms, is a heightened time of testosterone. Now, for older bulls, that can last for a month or so at a time. And it sometimes makes them a little bit more aggressive. It definitely tends to push them towards associating with females and females also show much more of a preference for males in must in terms of mating opportunities he's not at the point where he's so heavily in must that he is secreting from his penis which usually happens at the height of their must cycles they get a sort of a constant dribble of greenish urine was secreting from his temporal glands ever so slightly and that smell that i described is not like the usual wonderful grassy smell of elephants there's a very hormonal undertone to it and of course always to be treated not necessarily you, do, you certainly wouldn't take chances with elephants not in must but certainly to be treated with a little bit of caution and just an awareness that they are slightly more unpredictable than elephants, elephant males that are not in must. Hello, boy. Oh, you are secreting. Hmm. Sure. These are smelly gentlemen. Here he goes. He's going to wander off. a very good question from both crystal and from cat and it's something that very often is asked by people who who observe shots like that with the power lines in the middle and they were both you were both wondering whether or not elephants ever knock over power lines which makes sense they knock over trees and the answer is generally no they don't now i'm fairly certain that they sense the electrical hum and even as human beings with our senses we can hear the sound of the electricity thrumming through the power lines and i think that in their its own way discourages them from doing so now generally when elephants knock over trees they do it for one main reason and that's to get the leaves or the bark sometimes they do it out of frustration or to vent or to show how strong they are which is a very impressive feat definitely something that i've seen them do before uh, but I've never had an elephant knock over a power line. I have heard of it happening, but it's highly, highly unusual. What they might sometimes do, what rhinos sometimes do as well, is rub themselves on it. So it basically yeah, becomes a scratching uh, post for them. The 
notice I'm going very, very slowly. The reason behind that is, first of all, the leopards, of course, are cryptically coloured creatures. And I want to make sure that I haven't missed him or his tracks, especially on a hot afternoon like this afternoon. Keep your eyes peeled under patches of shade where he might be hiding, seeking shelter from the blazing African sun. But also, the fact that there have been so many elephants around suggests to me there's a chance they might have chased him or he might have moved a little bit further away from them. Now, elephants are fascinating creatures, and particularly at the moment, they're quite grumpy. They, the drought is putting them under a little bit of stress, and as I said, there have been lots of large males around. <coughs> And I've seen elephants chase anything from impala to buffalo. And yes, I've seen them chase leopards before as well. Sometimes they get a whiff of them, they decide that they really don't want that leopard anywhere around them, even though they don't, aren't in any way threatened by the leopard. Brent and I are scouring Triple M, as you can see, he's making his way towards us. large prominent turn of one I can think about is the one at that brown mm -hmm. ivy tree and That's I can't see him in well. there unless the guy's got his distances wrong. Maybe. I think I might go all the way down. And, and I would check. even check um, down towards Arifusa. Triple M also or Triple M. So it was a uh, transfer vehicle coming from Cheetah Plains. Oh, so, so it could have been Main. on Gary Main. Yeah. Well. And there are more big termite okay. mounds there than cool. here. Awesome. All right, we'll go and check there. Otherwise, the Ellie's might have I think I might go find some back. elephants. Yeah. There's lots of Ellie's. There's a nice big bull in must. Oh, fun. Yes. Have a big elephant. Enjoy. Bye. Cheers, guys. Uh. And while Brent drives off, I'm sure that you're excited to jump on the back of his vehicle and see how it goes. So then, on you hop. I'll catch up with you later. So there we go. A little switcheroo as the crosseroo happened. And uh, let's go see if we can catch up with those Ellie's. So I just heard... Well, I saw down the road, I could see that big master ball that you were looking at with Jamie. Now, I think there's about to be some misbehavior, or at least not misbehavior, some uh, shenanigans, I suppose is a better word. There's a big breeding herd, I've heard, that are coming from Sydney's, and they're going to sort of collide with where that big heavy bull is heading. So I'm just going to speed up a little bit. Try to get ourselves in the right spot. that big herd when they meet up with the muster ball. Quite often there's quite a lot of interaction when that happens. There's more Ellie's over here, so lots of Ellie's around. Ah, there's that big muster ball. I wonder if it's the same one. It looks a little bit further away from where Jamie last had it.
nice chest. There we go, who's that coming past us now? Taxi! Hello, Tax. What are you for? It's a big must go heading towards Sydney's Nari. Yeah, so I'm gonna jump around. <laughs> Cheers and joy, guys. Smile! You want safari? We're going to be in time to catch this, that big bull. Take my hat off before it blows off. You see him yet, Brian? He did have that walk of a man with purpose. Oh, has he met another bull? Or was that the same one? He's just decided to change his mind. Have a careful look. And a careful listen. There I hear another Eddie heading off behind him. Is there anything? Is that other bull moving closer to that little drainage system? Well, he's heading back to join the big breeding herd. I really want to have a look if we can find that big musk bull. They are quite entertaining, often chasing creatures in every direction. Now, Derba would like to know what does musk smell like? Quite a difficult thing to describe. Um, the best way I can describe is it, it, it smells like must. Um, it's almost a very sweet smell. Brian, what would you say? It is a difficult one. It's a very unique smell. Nothing really, anything else that I've ever smelled that smells similar to it. general trajectory has beaten us to it. Does it look like it? Yes, he's already snuck past us on his way to the waterfall. Could be in these, there he comes. Just try to figure out which path I think he's going to take this one. of them marching, yes, I can, in the right spot. Okay, this is really exciting, guys. Right? Yeah. This monster Ellie bull is about to walk right past us. We've positioned ourselves that he's going to come down this path. Here he comes. Hello, big boy. Hello, big boy. Oh, he's massive. Yes, hello, mister. Why are you making life difficult? We gave you lots of space on the other side. 
Maybe he just wants to get a closer look at Brian. This is very typical elephant bull behavior, especially when in must. Shaking his head a little bit. Off he goes. have urinated. Oh, he's moving on already. But he's looking, so he's smelling different spots of urine. So he's looking for a female and he's stressed. Big body bull, nice young big body bull. I'd say probably 35 to 40 years old. Looks in magnificent condition. A mission. He's probably smelt that breeding herd we saw just now and decided you know, ladies were ready for love. So he try. There he disappears across our northern boundary, but we're going to just shoot up ahead a little bit so we can have a look if there are any other elephants. moment. And off he disappears in search of other elephants. And we're going to take his cue and do the exact same. Safari Live, and uh, Jack would like to know, is this a reserve or is it Terra Wild? Oh, we're being overtaken here. And um, put my hat on before I get sunburned. Sorry. Uh, Jack, it's it's a bit of a combination. It's a it's made up of national parks. Yeah. 
questions about which male leopard we're going to find, or hopefully, fingers crossed, find this afternoon. And apparently, James Richard has already made a poll of which animal we think it might be. Three options ready. No, actually, sorry, there's four. There's that other mystery male, not mystery male, but the new male that made his way onto Arethusa. Okay. Sorry, I know I'm ignoring you. Go take it personally, I promise. I'm just looking at the tracks. Hmm, so difficult to tell. Too many vehicles. So, apparently, James Richard has put four options one being a Vula, one being Tingana, presumably the other being Anderson male, and the fourth being a mystery. And there is another male that had wandered onto Arethusa. I heard reports about it a couple of weeks ago when Shadow had that Impala kill on Zebra Drive. Now, I have to confess, my fingers are crossed for Anderson. I have yet to see him. I've heard so many stories about him. I'm just really, really hoping that it might be him. Brent is back up with the elephants and he's still got that big bull. And so we've caught up with that other Ellie bull, the non-must bull. Looks a little bit older than the chap we're following. I've just heard there's a massive herd of buffalo en route to where we've just come from. So we'll just wait here for a little bit for this big guy before shooting across there. Oh, isn't that amazing? He's smelling the ground, probably smelling where that breeding herd has gone. They were around here. It looks like they have crossed out, out at some down the road in front of us. Hello, big boy. Look at this, look at this. He's gonna, he's gonna reach up. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? What, don't you like that? Look at it, he's gonna do it again. Look how he's lifting his head. I mean, look at that, he's right above us. Oh, this is so, so amazing and special. There's something just so calm and relaxing about these monster Ellie bulls. Not a care in the world, almost. Looks like he's gonna do it again. We can hear the breeding herd trumpeting around in front of us. So on these big marula trees like we see here, you see there's not many low branches. And that's due to these the elephants who are able to reach up and break down those lower branches. So they do create these wonderful looking marulas with very few little branches at the bottom and then there's just this massive straight trunk of the tree, not the elephant, of course, and then sort of widespread boughs above. So Isabella, who's seven, wants to know why the elephant doesn't stand on the car. Well, Isabella, we are quite big in the car. That elephant's probably two times bigger than us, though, and he probably weighs a lot more than we do. Look at that, reaching to the sun almost. Well, doing some nice gardening for us. Just gonna move back slightly so the light's a bit better for everyone. Hey, big boy. So Isabella, um, it would be too hard and he wouldn't be able to lift his leg high enough to stand on us. So he went by. So how's that light? Let's get you on a bit more even ground. Good. There we go. And Isabella, we, we pose no threat to him, especially if we drive nicely. And you can hear when I'm talking, I try to keep a very nice voice so he doesn't get unhappy with us. And you can see he doesn't mind us being here and we're not troubling him at all. 
So there's no need for him to stomp on us. Sandra in California is saying, if elephant tusks grow throughout their life, why do they not regrow when they break? Well, they do, Sandra. They're just obviously growing from a far shorter point. And as you can see from this guy's tusks, that both of them are well-worn. He uses them. So even that broken tusk there on the right-hand side is still growing. But as obviously as he gets older, the growth slows quite a bit. Might go for another reach. I know. Why reach when there's something much lower? So we're going to notice how he lifts his head before he goes for that reach. treat coming as well but not just yet but slowly moving towards us is a tiny little baby or oh, it looks like he might have a scratch here we go look at that foot you can see the base of the foot and there's those beautiful cracks that leave those wonderful tracks we see Elephant's foot is very uniquely designed, and we will chat a little bit about the design a little bit later. But while we've got these Ellie's right in front of us, let's just keep enjoying this wonderful moment. And there's a little female that's just moved closer. And he's going to go and say hello, it looks like. She's adopting a little bit of an aggressive stance towards him. Mm -hmm. Or maybe a bit more of a fear. You can see the massive size difference. That's a young female. And next to that big bull, she's minute. Is that possibly a little bit of elephant flirting? I mean, she's still a little bit young uh, to be mating just yet, another year or two. That's a sweet little moment. Let's just move a bit closer. Get some of the bubbles out there. Also, a really tiny baby with that group, I would say. So get the sun behind us so you guys can get some fantastic screenshots and my cameraman don't shout at me for making their life difficult. That little guy. Oh, going behind the other two now. Looks like this is not going to be the best spot after all. They changed. I thought they were going to move out in front of him. They moved out behind him. And they're now coming in front of him. Just hang on. And the biggest 
one. Look how small that elephant calf is in comparison to this big bull. size as the big guys oh, or the big guy's trunk is about the same size as the middle of the little elephant oh, there we go. and you can see there's an, an adult female towering above her little family group and she still is dwarfed in comparison to the big boy. You probably find they are still part of the larger family group, our big breeding herd of Ellie's that's around here. And they've just spread out to feed at the moment. Now, Christina, who's a brand new viewer since yesterday, welcome on board, Christina. Christina would like to know, do elephants get their water requirements from the food they eat, from the leaves and from the grass? Not at all, Christina. A big Ellie bull, like the guy on the left there, he'll probably drink 100 to 120 litres of water. So over 20 gallons of water a day. Females probably not far off that as well. They also need quite a lot of water. Speaking of water, I felt it was a good spot, a good time to have a, a drink myself. So it is quite nice. Oh, look at him playing. Still hasn't quite got the master and the use of his chunk yet. That'll only happen. He's a bit older, so a lot of Eddies, when they're at this age, spend most of their time trying to figure out how to use their trunk. <laughs> Isn't that cute? Okay, yeah, sounds like quite a lot of elephants around them. He had branches breaking all over the place. as it looks like it's going to happen here. Oh, look at that, look at the little one playing. Don't often spend that much time with the breeding hoods. They're often on the peripheries, so it's really great to actually see them together. And elephant males take no active part in raising the babies, only in making them. See how his little ears are flapping away to cool him down. Amazing thermoregulatory system that elephants have. Jasmine in Tennessee is wondering, are elephants anything like lions when it comes to unknown offspring? Will they attack and kill offspring that are not theirs? They won't, Jasmine, very, 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 very different to lions. Uh, they will not attack uh, offspring. I mean, it is possible, but I don't think for the same reasons at all. 
only time I've really seen a bull attack youngsters is to get at the females when they're trying to mate or in severe droughts when the water is water shortages are around it's not only attacking the baby it's attacking the whole herd trying to protect very limited water that they have and i've never seen that in the sabi sands as such but is that half trunk mm -hmm. it is half trunk i didn't even realize well not half trunk three-quarter trunk maybe is a better description that female, adult female there, has a shortened trunk um, from a wound when she was younger. So, from the largest and heaviest land mammal in Africa to the tallest with Jamie. There is a lovely giraffe there, I promise you, hiding behind those trees. She is, however, playing hard to get. Let me see if I can reposition and get you another view of her. She was so beautifully out in the open by this beautiful pan and the bourbon on the termite mound, this beautiful setting. Okay. But she doesn't, didn't feel particularly okay. like being on screen and being okay. cooperative, okay. so she's wandered off. She's a beautifully dark female. Unusually dark for a lady. Now, we've discussed that many times before in terms of giraffe and their coloration and the fact that they do go darker with age. However, there's also a genetic factor involved within that. Hello, girl. You can be cooperative, it's all right. I'm not coming to scare you. Yep. She is not having any of that. You might have to just be content with the views that we're getting at the moment. But you can see what I mean. She's so dark. She's almost black in places. Hey, girly. Not comfortable. Hmm? You can see how well those spotted colorations and patterns across her back work in terms of helping her perform a very rapid disappearing act. We see you. Take a move. <laughs> We're still sitting with these ellies. I just wanted to see what was going to happen, and not much happening just yet. So I think let's go see if that big herd of buffalo has popped out at Sydney's waterhole. And oh, there we go, little fella. And let's go see if we can have a look at them. And then we'll definitely come back. Lots of elephants around, and I do love spending time with ellies. might actually be heading towards the waterhole where the slowly heading towards the waterhole where those buffalo are where they go so we're going to head in the same direction so don is asking how often do elephants have babies well Elephants are actually in an area like this when they are unmolested, actually very successful breeders. But uh, they will all normally have a baby, what's the say, once the first one's weaned, they're weaned at about five, six years completely. Uh, and then I think it's, I'll double check for you now, but I think it's another couple of years. Uh, so probably every seven or eight years they can possibly have a baby. 
one is also remember you've got to include that incredibly long gestation period in. Uh, does anyone out there know how long an elephant's gestation period is? If you do, pop us an email on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. And the team Sydney's water hole is seriously busy. It was busy this morning and it's been busy this afternoon. So is it possible that that elephant bull is the father of the baby and that's why he's allowed to be so close? Peggy, it is uh, impossible to say. Uh, I don't think it would make a difference whether he's the father or not, how close uh, the females would let him. If he was in must and being very boisterous, they, they would move away briskly. But a nice and relaxed bull who's not in must like that, um, I don't think it makes a difference whether it's the father or not. Uh, well, for a large herd of buffalo, they seem to be quite... Ah, oh, there they come. They haven't arrived yet, that's why. I can just see them coming through the bush, so I'm going to head up. Sorry, we do get some bad signal around here. I'm just going to quite try to scoot through it. small herd here this morning but I think I'm able said this was a big herd so let's have a look and they actually spread for quite some distance through the bush over there so the front run is almost at the water but I can just see movement masses of buffalo coming through the quarry thickets to Polly, Country West, Mike and many others who uh, got that elephant gestation spot on. Uh, it is 22 months. Of course the buffalo choose to drink behind the glory bush so we're going to just idle forward slightly. Uh, hello, let's get past. How's that Brian? There we go. that for perfect timing we arrived as the buffalo we're arriving hopefully they head towards us then we can see a nice waterbuck and parlor and andrew from cheetah plans oh and come look just off to the left there brian egyptian geese and goslings oh, a whole bunch of them there in front of the buffalo, heading down back towards the water as well after grazing. So this is definitely bigger than the herd I saw this morning. So there's probably about 100 individuals in the herd this morning. I think we're already on about 100. And they still seem to be coming out of the bush. Thirsty, that one. Jogging. Now, 
Now, these herds, specifically in these very dry times and during the dry season, are continually harassed by lions and having to move big distances between where there's water and decent grazing. A lot of them are in quite a weakened state at the moment. It makes them slightly easier for the lions to catch. is running in the bottom of frame. There he is. There we go. Mongoose, Impala, and Buffalo. So again, I heard it was a very big herd, but oh, maybe there's a lot more coming that we haven't seen yet. And maybe my perception of a really big herd is a bit different coming from northern Botswana, where a really big herd is a couple of thousand rather than a couple of hundred. The biggest herd I've seen in the Sabi Sands is about 800. That's a big herd for this part of the world. There are still a few more stragglers. surprised there's no hippos in the water and if we go off to the left slightly by at the base of the dead trees in the water there's the hippo there's your hippopotamus is it yep there's a the hippo there and to see there we go there's actually a couple of hippos there This herd is not the massive herd I was expecting, but still beautiful nonetheless. That looks like about it. So a little bit bigger than the one from this morning, maybe 120, 150 or so. Paul Rizzo says, side we are entering the dry season when there was no wet season. Yeah, we've had about 50%, less, sorry, less than 50% of our normal rainfall for this time of the year. But it is going to be really exciting. All the big musk bulls back. And he could cause some havoc. So let's leave the buffalo. Uh, most of them have finished drinking now. Look like they're going to head off back into the bush and they are heading east unfortunately away from us there they go a few stragglers still on the way but that must bull is heading straight to where that other bull was so safari dean is wondering how often do predators hunt at the waterhole uh, quite often they'll hunt when they are there, uh, but they don't necessarily, in this part of the world, sort of stake out a waterhole. But in places uh, like Naipan in northern Botswana, they literally, during the dry season, there's only about three or four natural seeps in that whole vast Kalahari area. They literally just lie there and gorge themselves on springbok and wildebeest. Okay, so we're gonna, there's that big bull, there's his bottom disappearing, and we're gonna loop around to get ahead of him. I want to see what his reactions are with the other elephants. It could be fascinating to see the interaction. like to know why there's an elephant sway its tail and its ears. Well, its tail is to keep away nasty biting flies, 
Japan and its ears is to cool it down. That's a massive air conditioning system. Uh, it can have up to eight liters of blood, which is just under two gallons of blood in the ears. So the warm blood that's been pumped through the body is then pumped to the ears. And then they, as they flap the ears, it cools the blood down. So they send out cool blood and the next warm blood comes in. So it's a continuous cycle. And when it's really hot, you'll notice them flap more. Okay, where is he? There's he. Now where's the other bull? The other bull we left around here. He looks like he's headed west. Oh no, there he is. He hasn't headed west. Okay, there's awesome other elephants in that block with him. It looks like he's decided to come this way. I'm just going to give him a bit of space so you can go down the path he's on. Hello, big boy. Nice to see you again. I obviously just went off for a little drink. Uh, in between chasing the ladies. Hello, mister. Oh, he's decided to come give us a little investigation. Oh, he's not. He's smelling where the females have been looking for that female in estrus and off he goes seems to be tracking with his nose so he's heading a little bit to the west we are right in the corner of our travis area okay so I'm worried he might disappear across the boundary, so let's stick with him while we can. I still think he might veer off slightly more to the east if once he smells where the rest of that herd went. But it's on the side of caution in case he does cross. he might cross. Maybe he's on the trail of a different herd. Hello, mister. You can just watch how his, he's tracking with his trunk as he goes smelling the scent of that female. And there he goes across our western edge of the traverse area. So while he goes visiting ladies in other parts, let's go see what our lady here on Safari Life is up to. Hiding back in her original spot where we first spotted her is our lovely dark colored giraffe. We're gonna have to settle for a long distance visual in this particular case, and she is so skittish. I'm very uncomfortable with the idea of us coming anywhere near her. Does she look pregnant to you? No, not quite. I think it's just 
round belly. It could be early stages. You see her breathing. But you can see her breathing like, and it's incredible. Look at the way her stomach and her chest rise and fall. Accompanied by the usual consort of oxpeckers. This was obviously the tree that she was after. I can't see what she's feeding on, but clearly that was what she wanted because even after she moved off away from us, she's returned to the same spot. I don't think it's the same tree that we can that she's hiding behind. One thing that Cat in Tampa has observed is that she has never heard a giraffe. And that's because Cat, you never hear giraffe making noise. I certainly have never heard them. Apparently they are capable of it. And a lot of studies have been done into the communication that happens between giraffes. But I personally have never ever heard a giraffe make a sound. And you can imagine how strangely shaped their larynx would be in that phenomenally long neck to produce vocalizations is something that would not be an easy feat. Uh, they make, they can, are capable of making quite a, a very low frequency sound. I've never heard it in the wild. I think I have heard it once with a habituated giraffe that was wandering around a camp. But even then I wasn't quite sure if it was the stomach rumbling or if it was actually making a sound. They are capable of it and they've started to do far more research into the communication and the different levels between giraffes as individuals. It's fascinating to think about. It's amazing what advances in technology and advances in research techniques has led to us being able to discover things we never knew. Hello. Yes, we see you. And as she watches us carefully and discuss the possibility that she might be pregnant, wasn't quite sure, I don't think it's a late stage pregnancy. I know that you were discussing the long extended period at which giraffes gestate, oh sorry, that elephants gestate with Brent. Giraffe also have quite an extended period of time. It's around between 15 to 16 months that they will be pregnant for. About the same as a rhino, if you're interested. Now, usually with the large animals, they have a much longer time spent gestating or the time in which the baby develops before they give birth. There we go, I've got an ice view now. Thank you, girl. I think she's munching on a buffalo thorn. There you go, see how important those eyelashes are in protecting her eyes. So she reaches forward into what is a very spiky tree to wrap her tongue around it. Yes, yeah, so about, essentially about just under a year and a half that a giraffe is pregnant for, and they don't lie down to give birth. So that birthing process is quite a rude awakening, quite a shock for the little baby that's born. It's got essentially a two meter drop as its first experience of the world. And life is harsh out here, for young, even for the youngsters. You can imagine, that's quite a, a considerable distance to fall. And I've seen a giraffe give birth once. Unfortunately, I didn't see the completed process. Um, she was feeling very, very skittish and nervous, and I didn't want to push her by trying to follow her any further into the bush. But I was fortunate enough to witness that. And of course, I think it was, was it yesterday that Brent had two baby giraffe, one of which still had its umbilical cord, and he said he thought it was only about a week old. And they're born so oddly disproportionate with those slightly, compared to the adults, slightly shorter necks compared to their body size, and long, long legs. They look ridiculous, but it's a good way of being able to, first of all, fit your head underneath mom's belly in order to be able to suckle and also keep up with her long strides. Very easy to over or underestimate how fast giraffe can actually move. But they cover enormous, and it's just because they look so graceful and slow as they walk. But because of the length of their legs, they can cover enormous distances. 
And I always find with giraffe, the longer you look at them, the weirder they become as an animal. Right down to their hooves that bear such enormous weight. They almost seem ridiculously small. If you think about the hundreds of kilograms of weight that they support. Such fascinatingly structured creatures. And since we've been talking about the way in which animals have developed it earlier on in the show, we were chatting about domestic cats. And we look at giraffe, and I've spoken about this before, the evolutionary theories as to why they have long necks, so easy to assume it's to reach up into the tops of the trees. And now scientists are starting to rethink that and have suggested that a far more plausible explanation is that it is a reproductive advantage. So the giraffe, the males with longer necks, and I'm not sure how many of you have been fortunate enough to witness giraffe fighting, and a serious fight between giraffe males is something spectacular to witness. They swing their heads around and bash each other on the sides and on the legs. It can be incredibly violent, and if you have a look, there are some amazing clips of the ripples and the shock of the impact of each other's heads. The longer the neck, the more momentum they can gather, and that's actually what scientists believe is lead to giraffe having long necks. It's sort of similar to kudu evolving those long spiraled horns. The females have slightly shorter ones, but when you watch giraffe feed, very often they're not feeding at the full extent of their height. This female is at the moment, she's really enjoying whatever she's munching on. And just a quick update on our other spotted creature that we were looking for. No sign of this mystery leopard, no tracks on the road. I haven't been able to get a clear track. I'm still not entirely convinced that those tracks I saw was were from the leopard. They've been driven over repeatedly and I couldn't find any clear ones to confirm it. I've driven all along Triple M and all along Gary Main, but I did hear scroll alarm calls in Hoffman's which is just to the south of our boundary, and the squirrels sounded furious. And it wasn't just one, it was several of them moving. One would start up a little bit further along to the west, and then one would carry on. So what I've actually decided to do is go back and check that area again. I just wanted to do a quick loop. That If that leopard is on the move through the block, we might be able to catch up with it when it comes out onto either one of our boundary roads. Let's go and investigate, see if there's any sign of it. Let's um, see if Rusty will... Yay! And while I go searching for this leopard, let's pop back over to Brent, so it's cute because he's still with those elephants. So we've caught up with a big breeding herd now. I'm just trying to get into a spot where we can see them. They spread out through this mixed woodland feeding. So they're probably spread out over an area of about three, four hundred meters. So, you know, these guys look like they're going to give us the best view here. It's the island next to them. Hello. Something going on at the back. I can just see dust and pandemonium. It looks like two young bulls having a bit of a tussle, but that's what it gave. You see all that dust coming through there and there. Oh, there's a tiny baby Brian. Still trying to use his trunk. <laughs> Look at that. Come on. Work. Work, trunk. Work. <laughs> Can you imagine? It must be pretty frustrating for a little chap not to be able to do what he wants. <laughs> oh yeah, this has got to be on the radio. Craig, I think they're unattended. Thank you. 
Hey, Fem. Here we go. Oh. Success? Success? No. Yes. Oh. Nelly. Nelly. You can do it. So close. <laughs> Yay! Well done, oh, no, then you took it out. <laughs> good thing it's still at the age when relying heavily on mom's milk uh, and not feeding oneself there's mom a nice big big eddy cow It is, the light is getting really, really wonderful now. And it is special to just be sitting amongst probably about 60 or 70 elephants in total spread out through this area. Let's just move forward a little bit. I think there's some more about to pop out of the bush, but they're gonna hopefully move out into this big open area around Sandy Patch. Let's keep an eye on the little guy, see if he can master the use of that trunk in the next couple of minutes. into this little gory thicket here and hopefully they should move through or we're going to get an inquisitive here it comes that's what you got to love about a tiny little elephant bull they quite often get very curious when we close park when we close when we park close to them and quite often might leave the safety of mom's legs for a closer look at us wondering what has the more pleasant scent elephants or wild dogs well Kathy that's a, that I suppose it depends on how you look at it I, I get a great sense of excitement uh, from wild dogs and I get a great sense of well-being from being the smell of elephants so I think they're both really wonderful in their own unique ways and there we go she's coming right up to us while she pushes and feeds through the quarries That young bull at the back here, Brian, and we've seen him before. Very distinct splayed tusks that go out quite wide. Little, probably just on 10, 11 years old. And we're literally now being surrounded completely by this herd. And you can see by their body language, they don't mind us being here. She's actually come closer to us with her tiny baby. Oh, hat in the way. Look at him go. Hello, madam. And we've got elephants in front of us, to the side of us, behind us. Brian, you've got a visitor. And that little ball with the splayed things came and almost gave Brian a sniff. He's about to pop out now, but he came probably about three foot from Brian. Reached out with the trunk for a little smell. one coming through we're gonna to have to wait before we can move next two three coming through 
Hello. Amazing how quietly they can walk. Isn't this fantastic? So the rest of the herds just passed through. There might be a few stragglers, but we're going to go forward a little bit. Upset someone in there. Just heard that. Probably one of the little boys getting a, a talking to. So they're all spread through here. I'm just going to go up ahead. I'm hoping they're going to come out into this wonderful big open area. And while I do that, we're going to chat quickly. Chris is asking about an elephant's foot, and I did say I would explain it a bit better a little bit later when we weren't looking at elephants nicely out in the open. So it's heard that an elephant's foot is like a ballet dancer. I'm, I'm afraid I don't know much about ballet, so I can't really comment on that. But uh, it is a very unique design. I'm going to show you what it's shaped like shortly. Let's wait here and see if these enemies come through. Unfortunately, I think they are going to head down into this little river system that this is the headwaters of. So we'll just have a look at these eddies as they disappear into the thickets and um, explain the foot. And uh, then I think we might start me be meandering back towards the coolness. Foot. It's got a very unique structure. So, if you had to describe it, it almost, if you have a dissection through an elephant's foot, it almost looks like it's on tippy toes, but it's not. So, it's got an incredible thick, spongy, cartilaginous pad that is there that they are able to, that, that it acts as the cushion. And that's what their feet sit on. And if I show you with my hand what it basically looks like, basically they've got, it sits like that. So their toes and their phalanges are very similar shaped, would be like this, sitting like that. And then they've got that big, thick, sort of pad on the inside and it's really interesting if you if you google an elephant's foot uh, to see how that structure is obviously that massive pad is to take that incredible weight that an elephant has so that's the best way i can describe that um, i definitely should have a picture of it i'll see if i can find one i'll see if i post it on Twitter later on after the drive, but it is an incredible. So, uh, oh, there isn't that Eddie popped out on the road, but I think we're going to leave these Eddies now. It is getting slightly cooler, and we want to definitely be with the lions in case they decide to head off hunting or moving. So, as we depart, uh, let's go see what Jamie has been up to. Jamie has arrived on Arethusa. No sign of this mystery leopard. I'm starting to wonder whether or not he didn't wander down to Simbombili's one-eyed pan to go and have a drink. There are just no tracks coming across the road. However, I've taken a gamble and had a think and thought if it was Tingana and if he was further down the road than we thought he might have been, he loves 
needs to come into these drainage lines and it'll be the perfect place for him to come and seek refuge from the afternoon sun. That is currently the method behind my madness. I've been wandering through on these roads and just double checking really carefully in the shady spots. He loves to come and hide up in here. This is very close to where he killed that zebra. tracking and what you can tell from the tracks and Darlene you've asked now can you tell from the tracks whether or not or what the sort of the emotional state of the animal might be can you tell if they're being chased for example or if they're uncomfortable or stressed and Darlene unless you've got specific tracks of hunting at which point you can sort of confirm that they will be stressed and then sometimes maybe you might be able to conjecture that a breeding herd of elephants being followed by an elephant bull in must, for example, might be a bit stressed out. But as you saw with Brent, that herd seemed to be perfectly relaxed and in fact interacting with him. So that is a bit of a tricky one. I personally don't think that you can really, with any degree of certainty, tell how an animal's feeling. I'm trying to think if there's any kind of situation in which you could maybe um, extend your logic and figure out something from the tracks. Beyond the chasing and the, that automatic stress level, I honestly can't think of anything, Darlene. Maybe pacing. Lions occasionally pace up and down a road, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're stressed. It could just be that they are calling or scent marking or anything like that. What I always try and do, Darlene, and for the other viewers learning a bit about tracking from our perspective, I'm going to try and sneak up on the stake. Uh, be cooperative. Nope. There's two. Racing across. <laughs> Sorry, Andrew. I had hoped we might get a good view of them, but we didn't want to play nicely. What was I talking about? Oh yes, one thing I do like to do when learning how to track, and I never consider my tracking ex tracking education to be complete. I see you, little Baker. It's a male and a female. <laughs> nope. Dashing off. Little antelope species love to run very short in sort of short bursts of speed and then stop and watch to see if they're being pursued or if their cryptic coloration has managed to secure them a hiding place. Right, let me try and finish that thought again. So one thing that I love to do, oh, everything wants to run, I wonder if I haven't driven through lion scat or something. Everything seems to be a little bit unhappy with me this afternoon. I can't smell anything. large female water buck unfortunately right into the sun and we'll be able to have a look at how fluffy she is sorry my mistake looking very round bellied and there's that typical circular white mark around the bottom nobody really knows why they have those it does provide us with endless entertainment though and look at all of the nicks and cuts around her ears. That's caused by a combination of biting flies, biting around the sensitive edges. There we go, perfect. Thank you, Andrew. And then infection setting in and just eating away a little bit at the sensitive tips of the ears. She's been particularly afflicted with it. Might even have been some kind of specific skin disease. She almost looks as though the edge of her ears are frilly. And those will never heal up and become a smooth margin again. She'll always have slightly tatty ears for the rest of her life. 
Oh, I'm so glad on this boiling hot afternoon that I'm not a water buck. I know that they obviously keep themselves cool and that that coat isn't as heat con or heat trapping as it looks. But still, the thought is not a pleasant one, of being wrapped in essentially a fur coat. It's very hot and very humid this afternoon. Now, of course, that coat would be lovely for winter temperatures. And as uh, many of our regular viewers know, the reason that they have that coat is because, as the name Waterbuck suggests, they love to be around water and usually in it in areas where there are quite sort of regularly flowing rivers. They spend a lot of time wandering through that and eating away at the reeds and the soft grass around there. So they spend a lot of time in water. So that coat is coated in a nice waterproof oil to make sure it doesn't get waterlogged and then acts as a insulator for them. I think she's disappeared now. So we'll continue on for our search for the mystery male leopard. If I don't have any luck here, then I'm going to head off and lick my wounds at the hyena den as I was going to the other day. I haven't had, oh, there's, like, there's leopard tracks here and hyena tracks. Sorry, jolting poor old Andrew all over the place. Ouch. It's definitely hyena tracks. Where did I make a mistake? Maybe it was just a hyena track I saw. I thought I saw the tracks of a female leopard. Let's just check a bit further on. Now, Shadow has spent a lot of time in this area. I think the last time I saw her, she was very, very close to here, just a little bit to the north. Oops, no, I think I might have made a mistake. I think it might have been hyena tracks that I saw. But on the subject of tracking, and to finish off my train of thought with Tarleen's question, <laughs> one, of, one of the important things to do in terms of carrying, continuing with a person's tracking education, is I always try and look at the tracks, even with something like an impala. If I've seen a herd of impala run across the road, I'll go and I'll have a look at the tracks that they've left behind. If I see impala sparring, for example, I love to go and observe the patterns and see if in future I'm able to apply that and utilize it in a way that might tell me something when I next see those track patterns, which is why I took lots of photographs of the tortoise uh, of the soil after the tortoise fight to try and memorize what that track would look like so that next time I see it I'll be able to interpret what happened without necessarily having to see the animal. Interestingly enough, Susan has asked a question that I just received an answer to fairly recently. Susan was wondering any news on where the wild dogs are. Well, the good news, Susan, is that it seems as though they were on their way through Simbombili towards the Gauri Gate. They had, didn't find the animals themselves, but they did see the tracks. Now, we've checked all around that area, so we know for certain at the moment that they haven't crossed onto Juma, but they could well cross at some point during the night and come and pay us a visit for the Sunrise Safari, which of course is a very, always an exciting prospect. There's also another pack of wild dogs further to the south that has just crossed from Mala Mala towards Cheetah Plains. It looks as though it's the Sands pack. So everybody, keep your fingers crossed because we've had some wonderful big cat sightings. It might be time for our next wild dog sighting tomorrow morning on the Sunrise Safari this afternoon. You just never know with wild animals and when they decide, going to decide to come wandering through. Or in the case of the wild dogs, bolting through at high speed and high excitement. Of course, they have a profound effect upon us as presenters and we turn, I think Brent described it the best. He described his own reaction to wild dogs and he says he almost starts behaving like one of them starts to shake and get all jittery and excited. And it seems to happen to all of us whenever we see them. Just checking very carefully in the drainage line. Jasmine, who 
is one of the lovely ladies who sent through my answers about the Secret Seven earlier. Jasmine wanted to know, she's been reading a book on extinct and protected animals and would like to know if I could tell her any more about the burrowing owl. Jasmine, I can't, but I will look into it for you. It's not an animal that we would see within the Sabi sands. I'd be curious to know a bit more. I have heard of them before and I'd love to know more. It's one of those things that I think I've just neglected. But I promise you, Jasmine, I'll have a look into it and see if I've got any information. I know that Brent is absolutely bird crazy, so he might also be quite well equipped to answer that as well. He might know a little bit more than, than I do. So feel free to put that question through to him as well. I'd be interested to hear what he has to say. No, lots and lots of hyenas wandering through this area, but no sign of our mystery spotted cats. This is such a beautiful, this is probably my favorite part of Arethusa, these drainage line systems that run through. some babblers. I also heard a dwarf mongoose. In fact, I see a dwarf mongoose <laughs> at the base there of that tree there. I don't know if you've seen where it is, Andrew. Of course he has. Andrew's on the ball. Have I? Yes, it was there. Oh. That's exactly where it was. I think it's just ducked under cover. There he is. There you are. I thought I was going crazy there for a second. You can hear the rest of them chirping away. There's one actually sitting. I don't know what? Oh, they're all racing now to congregate around that fallen log that's in front of us. Oh, one, two, three, four, five. Chaos. Dwarf mongoose everywhere. They're at the back at that fallen tree. Oh, hello. Come on, go join your buddies. I love dwarf mongoose. They are one of the most fascinating little creatures. I think they might be one of my favorite animals to view. They've got such fascinating little dynamics. Bounce, 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 run. All going to dash to that fallen tree that's further ahead of us. They're congregating beneath it. Here is our friend. And they've obviously got an entrance to their burrows there. one vigilant sentry keeping an eye on the comings and goings of the world from its heightened position of about a metre high on the top of that log. Any elevation counts when you're a little dwarf mongoose with all kinds of potential threats around. Let's try and see if it's closer. Now we chatted about wild dogs and of course as the smallest predator that the Sabi Sands has to offer they also have a very similar social structure to the wild dogs. Just concentrating a little bit on creeping up. Here we go, this is home. Hello. Keeping an ever vigilant eye on us. Oh, a couple of heads poking out of the termite mound around them. But to the right there, I think you should see one, Andrew. There we go, there's a head. Hello. <laughs> and this one. Hello. Yes, we see you. We see you. <laughs> and as I said, that fascinating social structure. Oh, baby. two of you. And that's a little one. That's a little baby. Awesome. Three of you. One baby, two adults. Two babies. There's a baby at the back. <laughs> Having a good sniff around. Come on, little babies. It's okay. You could come out. Bright eyed curiosity. That one's got a little white patch under its chest. Oh, have a little. Investigation, just like, oh, nope, scary. That was too scary, got too scary. 
just like our little hyena cubs at the den. There's one, the sentry is frozen watching us on the log. He's on the right hand. Yeah, there he is. Perfect. Thank you, Andrew. Hello. Look at the claws on that animal. Just look at that. Fierce little weapons. All of just a couple of inches long and a couple of inches high. And savage little predators. Awesome. And those bright brown eyes with very strange looking horizontal pupils. Oh, settling down, comfortable now, with us being around the den, the burrow. Those are really impressive. That's some seriously impressive weaponry. If you ever see a dwarf mongoose yawn, which we've managed to capture on camera before, you get an idea of just how fierce those teeth are. Oh, they've got little youngsters hiding in this particular termite mound network. Yes, little baby. Amazing how much darker the eyes of the babies are compared to the adults. It's a really noticeable difference and I never realized that before. And already all those instincts of an adult, slightly more rounded face, slightly blunted nose in comparison to a fully grown dwarf mongoose. They won't grow very rapidly though, this little guy is probably about, oh, what's she spotted? <laughs> the little guy is probably a couple of weeks old. And Andreen, I'm glad that you say that these little guys are one of your favorites. They're definitely one of my favorites as well. They are so entertaining to watch. Now, most likely, 80% of the time, this is going to be the offspring of the alpha breeding pair. So usually it's the alpha that breeds and as I said, produces 80% of the offspring. Sometimes subordinate, hello, subordinate females do breed. There you go, it's giving a little contact call. It sounds a bit like a bird. It goes, chip chip. Sometimes, as I was saying, the subordinates do give birth to youngsters. Unfortunately, they tend to have a much lower survival rate than offspring of the alpha breeding pair, very similar to the way in which wild dogs operate as well. And usually the alpha female breeds about twice a year, sometimes even three times a year. So the development of the youngsters, that one winked at us for a second there, Andrew. Now just blinking, batting her eyelids at you. Oh, yeah. I think she likes Andrew. <laughs> Amazing to watch. But I got completely distracted. That was not what I was going to talk about at all. What have we got up here? Hey, Andrew. We've been looking, We've for, been these. looking for these guys all afternoon. How awesome is that? It's been a long time since we've managed to catch a brown-headed parrot on camera. The vegetation has been really dense. Well done, Andrew. How funny is that? Andrew and I were just talking about them earlier. We heard them, but we were saying how difficult they are to actually catch on camera. They tend to hide away in the denser vegetation. There you go. Oh, having a good scratch there. Hello. And those seriously powerful beaks for breaking open seeds and fruits. <laughs> Being a good scratch around and so familiar to those of you who have had pet birds in the past but this of course is a wild and naturally occurring species of parrot in this area look how dexterous they are and how well balanced they are the way that they can grip onto something like that little twig and then turn upside down of course they have to be Brilliant. Well done, Andrew. That was awesome. That's the first for us in a while. It's been a long time since I've managed to get a brown hooded. Not that I had anything to do with that. That was purely Andrew's skill and observant nature. Okie dokie. 
I think I was in the middle actually of talking about baby mongooses and I think there was a question about whether or not they are blind and how big they are when they're born. And I have to I have to be honest, I don't know if they're bl born blind. I suspect that they are, but they do develop very, very rapidly. Actually, I take that back. They probably aren't born blind. That probably works tremendously to their disadvantage in the same way that hyena cubs are born with their eyes open. But in terms of guessing at a size, I would say a couple of grams and probably about that big. I'm trying to think of a good example. Roughly the size when curled up of a tennis ball is maybe I give you a sort of rough estimate. So Holly, I hope that answers your question. I suspect they're born with open eyes, but I'm not 100% certain. And speaking of den sites, I want to race back to the hyena den now that it's a bit cooler. And while I do that, Brent has made his way back to the Inkuhuma Pride. Let's find out what they're up to. And the Inkuhumas have not moved a muscle or well, probably a few rollovers during the time we've been gone uh, no stretching as of yet but just some very flat comfortable looking kitties but it is that time of the day where there is that possibility they might get up and move or something might stumble into them and as i know a lot of our regular viewers would have heard me say the most important weapon in your arsenal of seeing great sightings is patience. Of course, a little luck helps as well. I'm sure the lions are enjoying the fact that the fly population this year is not so bad. Dylan in Iowa is wondering how long will a lioness mate with a male or males? It's normally four or five days, Dylan, um, but sometimes she can have a false estrus or an extended estrus. So up to 10 days, so it has been quite a long time. Um, and as far as I hear, she still is mating. Uh, the last she was seen yesterday with one or multiple Birmingham males, I'm not 100% sure but I think she should possibly be heading back towards the Pride in the next couple of days. Here we go. Movement. A little bit of stretch. Uh, a self-hug. Here we go. Oh, cuddle. And back to sleep. It is very... Very funny looking. Oh, there's a leg stretch. Well, this is more movement than in the last couple of minutes we've been sitting here. I think that bush might be being a bit irritating. Tickling her nose. Not that irritating, obviously. interesting how you see with a social cat how close they often lie to each other even though it has been very hot today and that's just affirming those social bonds between the pride and a good close-knit pride is often a very successful pride While we're sitting here with the sleepy kitties, I've got a test for you guys. And uh, let's see. I don't think I've done a tree quiz for such for some time. But that lioness on the left is lying under a tree. And normally we see them a bit bigger. There it is there. And if we zoom in on the bark, Brian, very distinctive bark in there. You can see very, very distinctive 
shape. So who out there knows what tree this could be? If you think you've got an idea, pop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. See very distinct little crinkly leaves. It grows to a much bigger tree. This is a small one. Looks like it's had a bit of an argument with some elephants. So, what tree have the Inkahuma pride decided to lie under for the day? Very, a very flat cat. There's, oh, there's a little bit of movement. I think that bush is... A little thorn bush there she keeps just sort of, as she dozes, leaning into. But still obviously not irritating her enough to make her get up and move. Quite a nice little breeze picking up at the moment. during today's sunset safari, I would strongly recommend keeping a close eye on the Juma cam overnight. They're not too far from there, so hopefully they might come for a drink. Nutritional Gamer, uh, thank you very much, and uh, you are correct, Nutritional Gamer is watching for the third time and is from Hawaii, and said, wow, this place is awesome, and it is, and we're so lucky to be out in the African bush on a daily basis, and amazing we're able to share it with you all the way from the island of Hawaii to Juma Private Game Reserve in the Sabi Sands South. She's dreaming. Just a little leg, little leg twitch. So I think big cats do dream, and you sometimes see those little leg twitches, like they're chasing something. Apparently, you were chatting about it this morning, and maybe they were dreaming of Valentine's Day with the Birmingham boys, or possibly chasing down a nice tender buffalo calf. Here we can see a nice view of the paw. And those are the footprints we followed this morning made by that very poor in the sand. We were looking at that very poor print as we headed out and tracked and found them. Amazing how still the bush is at the moment. I can hear one red bat shrike squawking somewhere. Fork-tailed dronga in the distance. So, first answers are filtering through for the tree quiz. Lynn would like to know, is it a Timberti tree? It's not, Lynn, but Timberti does have similar bark to that. Look at the leaves. Timberti's are dark green leaves. Here we've got these pale, almost crinkly leaves. 
Tim Bertie is have a round edge. I'm trying to see if we can actually spot Tim Bertie around us here somewhere. Um, no, no Tim Bertie's around here. But uh, let's see if there's maybe a bigger version of it somewhere. And well done to Safari Dean who got that spot on. It is a Ledwood or, uh, or Combretum in Berby. So there we go, well done. That's a small Ledwood that's been fed on by elephants. Quite a difficult one, so very well done. So while we sit here in anticipation of these cats doing more than rolling over and being flatulent, let's go see what Jamie's up to. And just look at this extraordinary sky that Africa has provided us with. I'm just going to let you enjoy the sunset for a few moments. And the mountains merge into the horizon. And you can barely tell where mountain begins and sky no, mountain ends and sky begins. That's where I was trying to go with that sentence. Absolutely stunning. Every sunset's different, and every evening is worth stopping by to have a look at and just observe as the day draws to a close. However, we still need to rush across to the hyena den and I just wanted to take a few moments to present you with one of the most extraordinary views that Africa has to offer. But let us rush on to the hyena den and continue on our search for wonderful, magical things to show you. Absolutely stunning. I always think it's so incredibly important. I've spoken about this before. But no matter how wrapped up you are in whatever it is that the time that you happen to be trying to find or that you happen to be looking at, it's important to just take a few seconds, and I try and do it every day if I can, just take a few seconds to stop and look at the sunset and let Afri Africa envelop the people that are around and watching these incredible views, just let it envelop you in the space and the silence that it has to provide. It's such an incredible feeling. But no sign of our mystery leopard, but still a beautiful, beautiful day and a stunning afternoon. a little bit about the Secret Seven, and I mentioned that I thought that the Honey Badger was a member of the Secret Seven. Turns out that it's not. But Brooke was wondering, do we ever get Honey Badgers in the Sabi Sands? And could we see them on a live drive? And we do. And we have occasionally seen them. I think the first time I managed to catch a Honey Badger on camera was with Andrew, actually. We did a mad and exciting race after it to try and observe it. Quick little creatures. Most of them I have seen on foot. I've yet to get one on a live bushwalk, but that's still an opportunity that's waiting for us. And there's a really, really nice, relaxed breeding pair that lives around Cheetah Cutline, Buffalo Cutline Junction that I've seen once or twice. Just wander into the road, stop and have a look at us. Definitely one of my favorite little creatures, an animal made of attitude. They've got incredibly loose skins so that anything, if anything does try to mess with them, tries to grab them from behind, they're almost capable of turning themselves right around, almost like they're turning themselves inside out. That skin is so loose. And because I've seen it catch a couple of cats by surprise, certainly leopards and curious young lions that thought that maybe a honey badger might present an easy target and have been shown to be completely mistaken by the savage little creatures. Aggressive and powerful, strong, crushing jaws, really long, sharp claws. Absolutely amazing little creatures. I was fortunate enough to spend a bit of time with one that was being re-released, not re-released, sorry, released into the Kalahari to be orphaned 
the mom was a very unfortunate victim of wandering onto a main road and being hit by a vehicle. Her little, her little youngster, little male honey badger survived. And at six months old, I got to handle this little creature and play with it. And I, I mean, I always have been a very strong advocate for keeping wild animals wild. But in this case, it had already been hand raised to a point in the process of taking it out on long foraging walks, teaching it to hunt for itself and scamp and forage for itself. Can we stop for a second? You can stop for a second. What have you got there? Looks like geese. No, Adi does. Awesome. Wah, 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 wah. I was once told that Heidi does make that call, that wah, wah, sound, because they're afraid of heights and afraid of flying. <laughs> and I can't get that image out of my head. I always, whenever I see a Heidi doll flying past, I imagine flapping wildly going, ah! <laughs> in sheer terror at what it's experiencing. That isn't, of course, the case. They're not afraid of heights or flying, but it's something that I cannot rid myself of that image. It does present an amusing one, though. But I was in the middle of chatting about the honey badger. His name was Badger. Badger has now been completely released into the wild, occasionally wanders back to visit, and once brought a girlfriend home to visit. But other than that, lives completely wild. But at this point, he was six months old, and I was sitting down. He climbed onto my lap after swallowing an entire bird, feathers and all, that he'd munched on. And he proceeded to nip his way all the way up my lower arms. And the next day, I was covered in semicircle bruises from the strength, even at six months old, of that jaw. And then proceeded to chase me all the way down the road. And I must say, a charging honey badger might not be the fastest thing on earth, but it's quite an intimidating sight bears its teeth and lopes towards you. And a honey badger, I would love to show you a picture, but I actually don't want to stop for too long and get distracted just because we're going to run out of time and light to spend at one of my favorite places on Juma. Hello, Impala. Sorry, boys. You're beautiful, but we can't stop for you now. No sign of Harvey or Nelson, depending on whose side you take. One-horned, one-eyed Impala. As Brent describes him, one-horned, one-eyed, and one ambition, which apparently is the reason behind the name Nelson. But yes, let us carry on. And while we race across, and we should be there in the next few minutes, I'm going to send you back over to Brent, who is still with his lying lions. Tiny bit of movement has happened, a rollover, and the one lioness off on the right there has lifted her head and is doing a bit of grooming of herself. So maybe, maybe we might be lucky and they might move before the end of the safari. is wondering why lions have to sleep so much. Billy, because they're unable to deal with heat easily. So if they can't sweat, the only way for them to deal with heat is to pant. And if their core body temperature raises by just a few degrees, it is life-threatening to them. And the reason they haven't adapted to deal with heat is to avoid clashing with the dominant daytime predator or diurnal predator, which is man. So at this time of the day, as the lions start thinking about moving, human beings or our ancestors were seriously considering getting home because they knew it was about to get dangerous. Not being able to see at night, obviously a huge disadvantage when there are big cats around. Yawn, stretch. Oh, it looks like suddenly this, there's been a switch. Everyone's rolling around.
No, the real thing is we want just one to stand up, stretch and defecate and urinate. And that's a really good sign that there's a chance of movement. Although all this yawning and rolling around and whatnot are precursors to movement. There we go. That's more like it. Got an itchy bottom. Oh, look at that little, little bit of face rubbing, paw on paw. Nope, not quite ready for the big stand-up stretch and evacuation of bowels just yet. So even though they are hungry, they're not that hungry. ahead. So we've got a request from Mary in Michigan. Oh, look at that tail in the face. Uh, for me to tell a story of possibly one of my best lion sightings ever. And it happens to do with a young male lion and a honey badger. And I know you were just chatting about honey badgers with Jamie. So... Watching a pride of lions doing pretty much exactly this, sleeping, and a honey badger came trotting down a path close to them. And the lionesses pretty much did what they did now. They stood, sat up, looked, and then lay back down, completely ignoring the honey badger. But a young male of about two years old decided, no, no, he can't let this opportunity pass. So he charged off, and he managed to corner and catch the honey badger. And the only way I can really tell the story is to sort of show you what happened. So I'm going to just go off the lines briefly. So what happened is this young male lion caught the honey badger, and he eventually managed to pin it onto the ground like this, with one of those big fat paws of his, keeping that honey badger flat. Now, honey badgers make some really, really strange noises when they're upset. So this honey badger is literally pushed into that deep Kalahari sand going, making very, very, very strange noises. So every time the lion tried to lift his paw, the honey badger would almost turn in his skin and try to bite him, so he'd push it back down again. And eventually, after about half an hour, 45 minutes, he's just sort of standing there on top of this honey badger, not really knowing what to do, thinking trying to catch this thing was a really bad idea. And then the lionesses got up and they started stretching and grooming and walking off down the road. Now this young man is still stuck with that. He doesn't know what to do. Mom and auntie and sister and everyone else is gone and he's still pushing down on this honey badger. And eventually you could almost hear him counting in his head. It's okay, I gotta get out of here. And he sort of goes, one, two, three and he pushes this honey badger right into the sand and just leaps in the opposite direction and takes off and this little honey badger charges after him going nah, 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 nah. fortunately for the lion honey badgers can't run too fast and eventually he did catch up with the rest of the pride but it was an absolutely fascinating little interlude and a very flat cat sighting so as we look over it's still predominantly flat Here's a bit of that grooming starting. Um, grooming themselves at the moment, not that social grooming that we do see quite often with lions when they groom each other. So Susan in the Netherlands, is wondering how far the mating lines are from these ones. Uh, last time they were seen, probably four kilometers, five kilometers, so not that far for a lion. And Susan's also wondering, how do they find each other again afterwards? By calling and by scent, Susan. So now that Nkuma female will probably start 
roaring once she's done with the off back to sleep with the mating and these these girls will probably reply and she'll come back and join the pride aha that's what we want there's that stretch a little arch of the back nice social grooming there touching faces i'm just gonna and flopping down again so lions quite often do this before they move i'm just gonna try move forward especially see a bit more of that how's that brian there we go oh and <laughs> flop we're now in quite a precarious position being directly downwind of them now being a protein eater Lion gas is definitely not something you want to smell too often. Well, I think we're almost immune to it by now. We get severe drafts from time to time of half a digested meat. <laughs> oh, bless you. Oh, we got up. And there we go. There's a the nice stretch. Oh, it's the female with a slight limp, so she didn't stretch too, too heavily. Now normally, there we go, urination, the other lines are starting to get up now, so it's almost like a signal with lines. This doesn't mean they're going to get moving straight away, quite often they might groom and play around for a little bit, oh, stand on the thorn, <laughs> there we go, she's going to smell that other lioness's urine, we might get a phlegm and grimace. Scent marking. There we go. The third adult up. Just the sub adult still snoozing. There we go. Smelling urine. And there's the Fleming Grimace. Not a very big one. Oh, and flat cat again. There's the Fleming Grimace, unfortunately not looking at us. There we go, there's that Fleming Grimace. Taking the scent of that other lioness over the Jacobson's organ and picking up all the little chemical signatures and messages that the urine is giving her and there's the sub adult looks about to do the same nope. let's see this is very very typical of lions that aren't that hungry get up stretch urinate maybe a bit of grooming and then flop down again for a little bit. down again but there is that real potential that they might get moving shortly but while we wait for that to happen Jamie's with the other apex predator here in the Sabi Sands
just with them, but actually looking almost deep into the eyes of one of the apex predators. In this case, it is the injured hyena. And I personally am fairly certain is a male. I could be wrong about that, of course. It's an individual with the injuries around its neck. Hello. Healing up nicely already. You can see, still see a little bit of the bulges. It's more prominent on the left-hand side of the hyena. Probably through some kind of scrap over, possibly over a kill. It's a little bit painful, I think. Every now and again, that twitching, I think, is from flies sitting on the injury. Shit. Sitting on the outskirts of the den. Probably with injuries inflicted by the clan members themselves. at the entrance to the den. Unfortunately, my way is blocked. I can't get closer. But you can hear them whining at each other. The little cubs are out and about. Oh, goodness gracious. This hyena in the entrance has stymied me. <laughs> but there's our favorite little bundles of trouble. And our little cub. Looks like it could be one of the Decembers. They've grown so much now, it's phenomenal. Munching away, exploring their worlds with their teeth. Here comes November, wandering in to investigate. My personal favorite, not that you should have favorites. I think it's November, maybe it's the other way around. It's getting really difficult to tell now. I want your stick. I want that stick. There's plenty of other sticks around, but I want that one that you're chewing on because you're chewing on it. And I'm going to take it away from you. Yep. It's mine now. <laughs> They're just like toddlers in their own way. <laughs> Such a dejected look from the little one that lost its stick. Don't worry, there's plenty of others. Oh. The ever graceful descent down the termite mound of the den. Now, the reason I can't go closer, just to give you a sort of an idea, is that the hyena that was lying up next to us has sort of restricted our ability to move around. I don't really want to disturb him. Given his current injured state, He is completely and nearly recovered, apart from a pretty ripped up neck. But Iggy has commented on something that I always find amazing. Come on. Yes, you can be brave. You can be brave, little December twin. Oh, so far away from the den. Are you going to come say hello to us, or you're not quite that brave yet? Thinking about it. Oopsie. Every now and again, there's a bit of a a back leg coordination fail. <laughs> they just collapsed in underneath it. <laughs> so entertaining to watch. I will never ever get bored of spending time with these particular animals. Oops, somebody stepped on a thorn. How terribly uncomfortable, right between the pads of the toe. Ouch, get it out nibbling away with those sharp little baby teeth that are just as sharp and needle-like as those of puppies and kittens when they first have their first eruption of their teeth. Oh, little one, did you manage to get that out? Hello. Yes, I'm talking to you. But apart from their... Oh, just got a whiff of the smell. Sure. This den is starting to become particularly pungent, and I have to move forward because it's the only opportunity we're going to get, and the cubs are right out. I can't go all the way close, but I can see Madam's new cubs. So I'm going to just go through here to get Andrew a view. Can you see them there, Andrew? Yeah, I can see perfect. Perfect, thank you. Look 
because the new little ones are out and about and <laughs> chewing on their first stick. It's melting Kirsty's heart in final control, melting hearts across the world as they nibble on and explore. Whoopsie. Whoopsie Daisy. What have you two got, you two little mischiefs? It's so, so incredible. What a privilege it is for us to be able to witness their growth and development and all of these learning curves that they're going through. Their first, one of their first experiences with a stick at a couple of, about a, I would say about a month and a half, two months old. Whoopsie, oh, it's scary, it's a little bit scary. Learning can be scary. How lucky are we that we get to spend time with these incredible creatures? And yes, Iggy, you are absolutely right. Their ability to heal, all animals out here actually, their ability to heal and fight off infection is simply astounding in my mind and their ability to learn and to watch them grow and develop we're incredibly fortunate for those of you joining us for the first time the mother of these cubs the hyena doing a nice big yawn there that is madam and she is the matriarch of this clan or as far as we know she is the matriarch of this clan there in comes her previous cub Bella to investigate. Amazing how tolerant she is. Showing submissive signs. Letting mom have a sniff. And as the cubs of the queen, so to speak, they will inherit her status. Look he's coming. So brave and curious. Looks like D2 in November have decided to come and say hello. Oh, not quite that brave yet, are you? Hello. Hello, Naughty. Come on. You can do it. You can do it. Be brave. And come say hello. And Fluffy's absolutely right. Fluffy has said even the big brown eyes of the adults are appealing and expressive. But the cubs are quite simply irresistible. Look at the intelligence in that, in those, in that face. There's something behind those eyes that is constantly learning, thinking, experiencing the world around it. Hey, Mischief. They're incredible. Definitely notice a huge difference in behavior between the one December twin and the other. November, of course, is the eldest of the group, is the bravest. All investigating, shame. The poor male lying off on his own, separate from all the goings on. Luckily, he's perfectly relaxed with us, sitting next to him and enjoying an outsider's view of a peaceful scene. But yes, I've definitely noticed a difference. There's the other December twin. Not quite as brave, or at least not quite as, what would the word be? I wouldn't say it's not as curious, or playing with one of its cousins there. <laughs> a pile of cubs rushing in. I wouldn't be surprised if one of the Decembers is a, the one that's slightly more retiring. I think it's D1 with a white foot is a male and that d2 is a female that is complete conjecture on my part this is awesome <laughs> getting bullied by the younger cousins oh my word andrew look at how far that little cub is out of the den both of them so brave I have to move forward a little bit so that you can see. Now, Bella's definitely here investigating his new siblings. 
as they have a sniff around. But Deborah was, oh, look at how tolerant he is of those little bundles of black fluff. Oh, getting very adventurous. Well, we've got a very active den site. Deborah, who is watching and familiar with our various hyenas, was wondering whether or not June is here. Deborah, I think, and it's hard for me to tell exactly, particularly at this distance, but Deborah, I think that that individual that they were playing with just before we started looking at the young cubs, it was June. I think that June is here. June's just grown so much, I'm actually starting to struggle to identify the difference between June, the February twins, and Bella. I'm fairly certain that's Bella up there. Look at this, it's a pile of cubs. We're all investigating, there's a bit of urine on the ground there, I'm not sure whose, but they're all taking turns to add to this. And that, of course, is why, oh, yes, have a good roll, have a good roll. <laughs> Already trying to anal paste, even at such a young age. This is awesome. We're going to be seeing more and more scenes like this as these cubs get braver and older. <laughs> At the moment, they're not quite coordinated enough, although showing some serious signs of being very brave. Whoop. Constantly running back to one very patient mother. Now, just in case for new viewers, you're wondering why it is quite dark and that I haven't illuminated them in any way. The reason behind that is at this very young age it's our policy to not spotlight them. We're just adding a further distraction at a time where they are young and vulnerable. But we don't put spotlights on den sites, particularly with cubs this young, which is why it was a bit of a rush to get here to make sure we could enjoy the last few moments of light with these <laughs> little belly sliding cubs. Whoopsie. And then back across to Mom. Having a good sniff around. Oh, someone's been lying in the mud all day. Incoming hyena has definitely spent its day wallowing in mud, probably around the Galago pan. Look how curious that cub is. Awesome. Well, I try and figure out a way around so we can get a little bit closer, although I don't think I'm going to be able to. Let's pop over to Brent, who has the lions next to the car. So, we are. Looks like we might get a bit of movement. And a little bit of phlegm and grimace there. So, they move towards us, and the one lioness is literally lying so close we can't even see her properly. There she is. So, they moved towards our vehicle and lay down. But they're still doing that very lion-like get up one to five meters, lie down again, get up, lie down again. So we've got the two who are lying right in front of the vehicle. A third up above. And the last one off to the right behind the tree over there. There she is, behind the tree. Now, the big question is, which way are the Inkhorns going to go? Are they going to give you a treat and pop out on the dam cam? They got us quite excited there. We thought maybe a little bit of movement before the end of safari just to flop down right next to us. So 
there. Zoe is asking, do I think the big cats are more frisky in cooler weather? And Playful says she sees that with her domestic cats. Most definitely. It's due to the fact that they are unable to get rid of heat easily. So to extend energy playing would actually raise their body temperature. So when it's cool or colder, they're definitely far more mobile than when it's hot. And it's nice to see it seems like they've calmed down after their being a bit jumpy yesterday from the helicopters around. And the helicopter was out obviously on anti-poaching patrols. But when you imagine to a lion, a very noisy, loud, big thing in the sky could be quite perturbing. You can see the little sparkle in her eye off our side lights. Or was she just looking at Brian? One thing about all the big cats, they seem to have that capability to stare straight through you. Not that they are at the moment. Definitely a new meaning to the phrase a twinkle in the eye so as the sun the last light of the sun is disappearing. The lines are starting to look like they might get a little bit mobile. But I still think it, probably before they set off in earnest, it's gonna be a little bit longer. I'll definitely be on their trail tomorrow morning, seeing where those tracks lead. Will they have made a successful kill? Will they be that little bit more hungry? And a lot of our regular viewers will know when I see a very hungry lion, it doesn't matter how flat they are, I get out of the thermos and the lunchbox and get stuck in and we're not going to move because the potential of being in the right place at the right time to catch them taking down something increases. It has been... Oh, ooh, she's on the move. So a little bit of grooming before the end of drive and it'll be very fascinating to see where they go and flop down again during the night. Hopefully they pop out on the Juma cam for you guys to watch. But from Brian and myself and from Jamie, Andrew and everyone in Final Control, it's been great having you with us. And I think there is a little bit of Jerry's cheesecake left that I think there might be a bun fight to see who gets it. But the thumb's about to say goodbye. So toodles and hopefully we can find these lines again in the morning.
Thank <laughs> you.